Okay, can you hear me? Okay, right, so uh, I'm going to need to talk quite quickly. This was originally going to be a much longer talk with all sorts of stuff in it, but I'm going to focus on the new stuff. So I'm going to talk about, a little bit about the game and its significance, because there's probably some people in this room who don't know this game, and those who are you who were elite rated in 1984, please bear with me. Then I'm going to talk about some of the efforts that have been done over the years to decode the game code. I'm going to show you some new elite hacks that I've done, and then I'm going to talk about moving towards having multiplayer BBC Elite, which I think is very, very close. So in the early 1980s, games were quite primitive, particularly those you could play at home. There were early consoles like the Atari 2600, the NES came out in 1983, and uh, they showed 2D games with sprites that moved around the screen. It was all quite basic. Um, there were 3D games, you only really found them in arcades. They ran on special machines with vector screens that could draw lines directly, sort of in analogue, in hardware. Uh, two good examples are Battlezone from 1980 uh, and the Atari Star Wars from 1983, both of which we've had running in the arcade at previous EMFs, so you may have had a chance to play these. Now you notice the graphics here, a wireframe, there's nothing solid, and you can see right through the objects. You can see the backsides of them, you can see the lines on the back. But it worked, it was playable, it was fun, and it was something you couldn't do at home. Um, now, there's a machine called the BBC Micro uh, that uh, was, came out in the early 80s. It was designed as an uh, educational machine. It was designed for schools, for teaching kids to program. We had books like this. You know, this is a book for kids talking about programming in basic and then 6502 machine code. Uh, that was how things were done back then. And uh, the games that came out for this machine were quite primitive at first. They were sort of sprite-based, they were 2D, they were knockoffs of early arcade games. And then in 1984, this happened. This is a game called Elite, um, and it had full 3D graphics, wireframe, but notice that the, the ships look solid. You, know, you can't see the backs of them. You know, and that was totally new. It had never been seen on a uh, home computer before, anything like this. It was a hugely ambitious game. In addition to the 3D graphics, it had this vast open world that you could explore, thousands of planets, all these dozens of ships that you could meet, and, and, and so on. I could spend an hour just talking about all the features that were in this game. I'm not going to have time to, but there's other places you can learn about it, and you can go and play it. You can play it on an emulator in your browser. It was written by these two guys, Ian Bell and David Braben, and at the time they were students. They were first and second year students at uh, Cambridge. They were working in their part in their spare time developing this game, uh, and they had agreed a deal that Acorn Soft were going to, to, to publish it. And the whole thing was kept under wraps uh, right up into the moment of release, and then there was huge fanfare, they had TV adverts, they had a launch party at Alton Towers. It was, it was you know, these sorts of things had never been done by a, game, by a game before. So, in terms of significance of this game, it was the first true 3D graphics on a, on a home computer. Um, it, it sort of set the stage of everything that followed of these open world games that you, you know, play now, things like maybe Skyrim or whatever, where you know, there isn't a level one, level two, level three, you just go out into the world and do whatever you decide you're going to do. Um, and it had things like quests, it had police who'd come after you if you were a fugitive and all sorts of things like that. And it had, the game has this kind of cult status for British nerds of a certain age. Um, because they grew up playing it and it was also this, this massive technical accomplishment on a machine that really wasn't designed for anything like this. I mean, the designers of the machine were amazed that this game was able to do these things. And it actually ended up driving sales of the BBC Micro. People were buying it just to play this game. Um, but what I want to talk about is understanding how this game worked. Um, and the efforts that have been made over the years to sort of decode the game code and, and make it understandable and figure out how it did all the tricks it did to uh, do this. I'm not going to have time to go into detail, but I'm going to tell you about where you can learn more about this, and then I'm going to show you what I've done with the game engine, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the details in the process of that. Um, so one of the first people to succeed in making sense of this was Angus Duggan. And he really, really deserves extra credit because he did this back in the 90s 
on original hardware. He did this on a BBC micro with his own homebrew assembly ROM. Um, de disassembled the whole thing, tried to figure out how it works, and then started rebuilding it, adding features. Um, which sounded impossible because the original game used every, almost every bit of memory uh, available. But he found ways to free up space and add things to it that weren't in it before. So it adds new ships, it adds features, it fixes some bugs, it fixes some balancing issues. Um, and this was really an incredible techni technical accomplishment. Um, in 1999, on the 15th anniversary of the game, Ian Bell, one of the original authors, released the uh, source code for the cassette version of the BBC Micro Elite. Um, and everyone got very excited. Wow, now we can read it, we can see how it works. Until they opened the file and it looked like this. Right? So it um, is, is just you know, line after line of 6502 assembly instructions. You, know, you get a few variable names, you get the, 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 the function names, um, but you know, a lot of them are cryptic as well. They're just like a couple of letters and a couple of numbers because that was the constraints of the assembler on the Acorn Atom that David Braben was working on at first. Um, 82 kilobytes of text in it, there are 57 comments, and I assure you they really do not shed much light on what any of this means. So, you know, this came out, we got very excited, we looked at it, and, and, but, you know, unless you wanted to read 82 kilobytes of 6502 assembly and make sense of it, you were kind of stuck. Uh, but people did. Um, uh, Christian Pinder uh, wrote, looked at all this, figured out how it worked, reverse engineered it, and used that knowledge to write his own re-implementation of the game that was reverse engineered from the BBC Micro version, but it ran uh, for Windows and it was written in C. And lots of people uh, then ported this to many other platforms. So this is a game that sort of works in the same way, but it doesn't shed any light on the tricks that were done on the BBC Micro in some ways, because it, it was written for a completely graphic, graphic system. Um, and then not a great deal happened for a very long time, um, until on the 30th anniversary of the game, uh, another file quietly appeared on Ian Bell's webpage, with this commented disassembly put together by Paul Brink. Now, he had gone through the code, figured out what each bit is doing, and added, added comments you know, on an instruction-by-instruction instruction basis, sort of saying what each bit was did, doing. It, it was still hard to follow. It didn't give you the big picture. You, know, it, it, you, you had to do a lot of work to make sense of this. But I started looking at this, and you could start to make sense of some of what the game was doing and how it was doing it, how things were stored. Um, another thing that happened uh, in 2018 uh, was that Kieran Connell, who's part of the, the BitShifters BBC demo group, um, ported the, uh, the cassette elite source to, to be buildable with BBASM, which is a tool chain for building BBC microprograms on modern computers. Um, and to do this, he had to re-implement some parts of the original build system in Python that did things like the checksumming and the encryption, which was part of the copy protection system. But it was able to build a sort of bit-for-bit -bit, um, reproducible build of the original game, and then, then it becomes easier to take the game, make some changes to it, uh, rebuild it, and run it on an emulator or real BBC Micro. And then uh, I, I did a little bit of work this, with this myself, uh, trying to... Paul, um, Paul Brink's commentary, which was from the disc version, into Kieran's work, which was for the uh, uh, cassette version. And I posted some of that on some forums, and nobody really replied it for a couple of years. And then two years later, I got a reply from Mark Moxham, uh, who, during lockdown in COVID, um, had started from this and gotten carried away. Um, <laughs> What Mark has done is absolutely incredible. Um, he has fully documented the entire source code at this point for every version of Elite, the, the cassette disk, second processor versions, and so on. Got buildable source for all of them, and he's written all these deep dive articles that explain how parts of it work. So if that's what you're interested in, go to this website. Uh, it's all there. Um, He's also got a couple of talks uh, which you can find on abug.org.uk where he, he's, he's, he speaks about this and goes through some of it. So if you want the nitty-gritty, this is where to get it. 
Um, another really good talk you can watch if you want to understand more about this game uh, came out about six months ago. It's called Elite, the Game That Couldn't Be Written by Alexander the OK. And it, you can find this on YouTube. Um, so now I'm going to come on to what I'm interested in. And I think it's the same thing a lot of people have been interested in over the years is, is a multiplayer version of this game possible on the original hardware? And how could it be implemented? And look, I was at the tail end of the BBC Micro generation. You know, I, I, I went through this book, but basically myself. The teachers weren't teaching this stuff anymore. The schools were replacing the BBC Micros with PCs. Um, I never really got good at, at 6502 stuff. Um, but I, I wanted to understand, you know, what, what would it take at least? You know, how might it be done? And so I needed to learn how the game represents states. So I dived into, this was before Mark Moxon, but I dived into Paul Brink's commentary and I, I tried to figure some of this out. Now, a, a ship state for one of the ships that are flying around in space in Elite is 37 bytes, and uh, of which 9 bytes is its position in three 24 bit vectors. Uh, and then there's a, a rotation matrix, it's a bit of a funny rotation matrix, but it's basically a rotation matrix. You have bytes that represent the speed, the acceleration, the roll and pitch rates, uh, the energy level, i.e. The, the health of the ship, and various flags that say about what that ship's doing and that the AI uses to, to update it. Um, and I started looking at this in a BBC Micro emulator, but it was a bit of a slog. Again, I'm not really so familiar, that familiar with the 6502. Um, so I just wanted to get this out into a language I was more comfortable working in. So I picked an address in the game loop where it went through that address every frame um, and patched the emulator so that once it got to that point, it would spit out the entire BBC Micro memory. So every frame, it, this is the emulator patch, it's just two lines, it just spits the entire thing out. And I did the rest in Python, which is a hell of a lot easier. Um, so I had to do some work sort of translating the representations that the game used into how we would do it today. So it uses a lot of tricks that are specific to the 6502, like uh, sign numbers are sort of stored with a sign and then a magnitude. The magnitude's always positive, and the, it's sort of not the same way we do it now. Uh, the rotation vectors uh, use a sort of, it's not even quite fixed point format because the, it's not on a, a sort of bit boundary, but uh, you know, hex 6000 is one. And there's the different coordinate systems that are used compared to modern graphics. But I, I tried to decode all of this, and I got a script that's sort of printing out the ship states as the emulator's running. But I couldn't really tell if I got it right. So the act shaving starts, right? I needed a way to cross-check uh, whether I'd got this right, so let's write a renderer for it. Um, and to do that, I needed to get into, as, as well as the ship states, I needed to understand how the ship models were stored. And uh, so I wrote a little script that takes the, the memory out of the emulator, uh, finds the, you know, walks through and finds where the, the address is where each uh, ship data is loaded. It differs as the game runs, because each time you jump from one system to another, it, uh, it loads different ships. And they look something like this. Uh, you have a set of points, you have lines that are defined by which points they connect, and then you have a set of normals, and the normals are the sort of hedgehog lines that are sticking out of the model. This is the missile here. And the game didn't have a concept of polygons per se, but each line was associated with two of these normals. And the way that the rendering worked, and how it made the ships look solid, is that as you rotate this around, um, if a face is visible, then, so then the normal line is coming towards the screen. And if the face is not visible, then the normal is slightly away. And you can work out whether it's forward or away quite quickly with a dot product. And that's how it does the, uh, the back face culling, the hidden line removal. And that's why the ships look solid. Now, for this to work well, you need all of the objects to be what's called a convex hull. And people go, oh yes, the elite, you, all the ships are convex hull. And it's mostly true, but it's actually not. Um, the, uh, the missile here had these little fins on the back, and they break the rule, right? It's not actually convex, and this is true of some of the other ships as well. Um, if, for instance, the, uh, the crate, which I have here, had these, t these two lines sticking out forward are not normals, they're part of the model, and they break the convex rule, but they're associated with 
the faces, uh, the big faces above and below, and they follow the same drawing rules. So it did some tricks to make slightly more complex ship models. So with this, I was able to write uh, a simple front end in OpenGL. Uh, I used VTK as a Python library to go and simplify some of the 3D graphics work. And so I got this version of the game sort of running where you could, you're still running the emulator, you're running the BBC Micro of the game, version of the game, but you're rendering it in modern graphics alongside that. It wasn't a perfect match, I didn't get some of the scaling right and so on, but it, it, it showed that I'd interpreted the game states correctly. At this point, I kind of got distracted from the multiplayer thing because this idea of re-rendering games is quite interesting. There's been some other cool work done. Uh, Tom Murphy did this thing a few years ago where he took uh, Zelda on the NES and turned it into a 3D game just by reading uh, out memory from the running emulator and uh, figuring out which things were floors, which things were walls, and re recreating it as a 3D game. But you're still playing the original game on the emulator. This has been taken a bit further with other projects for 2D games, like uh, 3D Sen does this for a bunch of NES games. Um, some of this is cheating a little bit, because you have to have some annotations that say how certain things should be interpreted. Um, but it's got me quite interested in, in how can we re-render this state, which I've now got coming out in a nice, nice Python API. And I started thinking back to vector displays. You know, so vector displays have no pixels. They natively draw lines. There's literally a, a beam sweeping across the screen, drawing a line from one point to another um, uh, you know, at, at the analog level, you know, driving the CRT. And Elite is all lines. So in, in, in this sense, Elite is actually perfect to do on a vector display. And at about the same time, my friend Mike um, had just built this um, uh, laser display that um, projects onto sc to, uh, a screen with a laser that's moving very quickly so that it can draw lines. And of course, as soon as I saw this, it was like, okay, we have to port Elite to this. Right? So, so I've got this project called Vector Elite, which is basically what might Elite have looked like if it were made a few years earlier as a vector arcade game, if Braben and Bell had been you know, down the road from Atari in Silicon Valley rather than down the road from Acorn in Cambridge. And um, uh, so this uses a library called OpenLaze, written by Hector Hartin, uh, which is an open source tool for driving laser projectors. Uh, you generate um, sound signals that it feeds to a sound cord, and you use those to feed the X and Y and the blanking signals to, to move the laser. Uh, and and you, you can do all this in real time. The API is a bit like OpenGL. Um, so I wrote some code that uh, does this. The, the, there's not much to it. The Python on the right is basically the entire uh, important part. I'm not going to go through it all in the space of this talk, um, but I'll publish it at the end. Um, so it, it does a basic version of the, uh, the, the, the backface culling, chooses which lines need to be drawn from the models, and then it, the part that's specific to the laser display is you have to figure out chains of lines that join up, that you can draw in one sweep. And each model has to be broken down into you know, one or more chains. So running it, uh, it looks something like this. Uh, we wanted to demo it uh, here, but it doesn't really work in the light. So we're going to run this tonight at the Edinburgh Hack Lab Village. If you want to see it running, uh, come there. Um, I think I can show you another quick uh, video of it running. Uh, one sec. Yeah, this one's got a bit of uh, combat in it. And everything in this is directly coming from the BBC oh, yeah. Micro emulator running in the background, including each of these dots of space dust. These are the same dots floating past. I had to turn them into lines so that uh, you could actually see them because dots don't really work on the laser. Um, so that was fun. And then I thought, well, what else can we do? Um, and I was still interested in the multiplayer idea, but that's hard, and I'll talk in a bit about why it's hard. Um, but what else does modern Elite, and by modern Elite, I mean there's the VR version now that's uh, fully multiplayer and so on, Elite Dangerous. What does it have that BBC Lite doesn't? Well, it has VR. <laughs> so at this point, I need a volunteer, um, someone who uh, is perhaps familiar with the BBC Micro version. Um, yeah, 
You want to come on up? Okay, that's fine. I'll get you set up. Um, right. Uh, so, yeah, this project I've called VR Yak Shaving Simulator 2024. Um, right. Uh, let me start some things up. It's incredibly hard to dock. Um, I'm sure you've got the docking computer. Yeah. Because everybody's first moment. Okay, so have a seat. Um, I will uh, get you flying. Um, so we have the uh, game running in an emulator here. Right, the controls, you need to remember, uh, left and right roll are here. Okay. Right, uh, S and X are up and down. And A is... Uh, Fire was... A, A is fire. Okay. Spaces go faster, and go slow is the key to the right of your, your other hand. Shift? No, I can't, that can't be right. Uh, no, the question mark. Okay. Right. Are you happy? Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, My fingers on the keys. So yep. Yeah. You'll take your glasses off. Okay, let's try this. Now, you should see a, a room. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, my fingers are not on the... Right, okay, so let me just do uh, this. And now you should get the HDMI. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so I should just need to press enter. Uh, okay, this is... Yeah, you're not on. Okay, right, one sec. I probably need to do something else. Um, stations can't see each other. It, it was, uh... So can see the... Yeah, no, the, the VR's running. That's, that's fine. We should have, um... Let me just uh, bring it back to my screen so I can solve this. How are we for time? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so I'm just going to try and make this work. I've got time. There's live demos and then there's this kind of bravery. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, my fingers are on the key. Okay, okay yeah, I think yeah. it's up, right? Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. And am I on the, yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, here we go. Um, so let me just put this back on the other screen. And. So, uh, do you want to try and find the space station? Do you remember how to do that? Yeah, it's from the radar, but... Um, yeah, so I think if you just pull up or dive, one or the other, it will get you pointed back at it. Uh, speeding up is... Space. Speeding up is space bar. Okay. Yeah. Still can't see the... Oh, okay. It's... Uh... <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to... Uh, Okay, can I uh, get you somewhere? Um, oh, okay. Right, uh, can you get yourself back on? That's S, X, and A, and one to the right. There you go. Okay, okay. right, so. Um, 
There we go. Uh, this is... This is original BBC Micro Elite running in the background. Everything being rendered is taken straight from the emulator memory. There's no cheating. Um, it, it, you're only seeing what the BBC Micro version is doing. So you'll notice a few things here. The, uh, the frame rate of the VR, when you look around, that's full 90 hertz. Um, but the frame rate that, that things happen at, the ship's rotating and so on, is, uh, is, is the frame rate of the BBC Micro version. Um, uh, okay, do you want to see if you can dock? <laughs> yeah, so, something else. Uh, I had to just put, put the instrument panel out in space because there's no provision in the game for uh, you know, your ship having any... Um, <laughs> Any volume to it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's stop it there because I need to uh, move on. But uh, there we go. I'll, I'll come to that. Okay. If you want to play this, come to the Edinburgh Hat Club Village later. We'll have it set up. You can have a go. Um, I want to point out a, a couple of things quickly. Um, so, uh, one is... Oh, let's start a fight. Here comes another cobra. That seems... Uh, oh, I'm on the wrong keys. Right, can you see this? Right, I mean, the great thing is, you can look over your shoulder, so if you get into a fight, um, you know, ship's going behind you, you can turn around and see them, right? <laughs> And uh, now, in, in BBC Elite, if you're being shot from behind, you don't see the laser fire because it only bothers drawing it if it's coming from a ship that's visible. But now I can see that these Vipers, who are now after me because I've uh, you know shot someone in the space station area, um, are chasing me, and I can follow the laser fire back to where they are and uh, go and take one out. There we go. Anyway. So, spent hundreds of hours doing this, not that I've ever done that. Um, let's come back to the slides. Uh, are we back up? Yes, okay, so that was VR Yak Shaving Simulator 2024. And uh, after having got this done, I finally came back to the question of multiplayer. And I want to talk a little bit about, about this, because uh, it's hard, and it's hard for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is the communication side of things. Uh, so, let's move over here so I'm on the camera properly. One is the communication side of things. So, there's a bunch of ways to communicate with the BBC Micro. The most obvious one to do uh, multiplayer with would be Econet, which was the, the sort of local network interface that was used at the time. Um, and there has even been some interesting work towards this very recently. Mark Moxon, who did all the incredible documentation work, has uh, patched Elite so that you can now load it over Econet from an Econet file server. Um, and there's a, a multiplayer scoreboard available, so you can have all these single, copy, single player versions of the game running on different machines on the same Econet work, network, and you've got a scoreboard showing you how everyone's doing. But you still can't interact. Um, so we did real-time communication, but that could be used as a basis for it. The other problem is code space. Um, anything you add to the game to implement anything like this would take up space, and you know, there's a, a renowned shortage of it. But there are tricks possible, like what um, Angus Duggan did, a lot of which was finding different routines that did the same thing and refactoring them, merging them to make some space for other things. Um, but if you take away those constraints, there's still some other issues. Um, Elite has a kind of pre-Copernican model of the universe. <laughs> Everything revolves around you. There is no global coordinate system. When you roll your ship, you're not rolling your ship. You're rolling everything else <laughs> around you. 
And, and that was very important because, you know, we don't think twice in modern graphic systems about having, you know, your world coordinates and your projection matrix and you map one from the other. Um, you just go ahead and do it. But every matrix multiplication or whatever else was, was a real laborious bit of work on a 6502. Um, so anything they could skip like that, they did. Um, so to even have two ships come into the spa same space and be able to say, I'm here, you're here, yo, so you should show me here, you have to agree on where here is. An elite has no coherent model of a place in the universe. There is only where you are relative to a player. Now, I tried various ideas for how we might define a coordinate space. Like, if you've got three fixed objects, you can use them to define a coordinate space. And there are three fixed objects in Elite. There is the sun, the planet, and the space station. But only two of them ever appear at the same time, because they use the same ship slots. When you get near the space station, the sun disappears. You ever noticed that? Um, so you can't use those. Now, you could use one of those objects, because they have their own uh, rotation matrices. The planet rotates, the station rotates, and so on. Um, but those uh, rotate with time. And the play game has no coherent idea of time, right? When things get busy on the screen and there's lots of lines to draw, the game slows down because of how much it has to draw. And uh, when you're flying through empty space, it goes faster. Right? It's not that the frame rate drops. Well, the frame rate does drop, but the, the, you know, the physics rate drops with it. The two are fundamentally coupled. Right? So you, 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 even if you used uh, the rotation of an object as, 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 as sort of your reference, you know, different players would have different ideas about how much that planet had rotated. Um, when I started trying to implement some ideas around this, I also ran into numerical stability problems because uh, Elite uses a lot of approximations for the math and uh, it, uh, if you start messing with it, those approximations start to fall, out, fall apart a bit faster and things start spinning out of control or shrinking or you know, growing and, and, and so on. Um, but I think there's an approach that may work, and I've been moving towards doing it, and I'm going to show you something that kind of half semi maybe does something. Um, so here is two copies of the game running at once. Um, I've marked one green and one red by splatting some stuff to the video memory. It's two cobras facing each other, and if I move one of them, the other one moves. I've got these two copies talking to each other, um, but I don't have the coordinate system quite right yet, so <laughs> roll, things move in the wrong axes, and so on. Um, but this is done using the same techniques I've been doing up to up till now, pulling stuff out of the emulator, but now also sending stuff back to the emulator as well. So. You can use this as a model to uh, you know, develop what code you would need to add, and once you've got something working, um, then go back and, and, and see about how would we implement it on 6502. Um, so this is work in progress. Uh, it's not ready yet. I had dreamed of having it ready here, and we could play a multiplayer going for leap, but we're not there yet. But it's starting to look tantalizingly close to being possible. And combined with what Mark Moxon has done with, with the Econet Elite, I'm starting to think this might be a thing that we could see for the 40th anniversary of this game in September. Um, so that's what I've got for you. Um, and uh, I'm about to push the code for the Vector Elite and VR Elite to here. Um, if you'd like to play the game, you can find it all over the internet. Um, I do recommend, if you do pick up the game and play it, find a copy of the documentation that came with it, because the box that this came in was a very magical thing that had not just the game and you know, the, the floppy disk, but uh, the, the Space Traders Flight Training Manual, which um, you know, is quite a sizable document. Um, that tells you all about the spaceship that you're going to fly, the world that you're going to fly out into, and so on. And I really like this because it was one of the first uses of law as a fundamental part of a computer game. You know, you, you, if you're playing something like Skyrim, you go around the world, you pick up books, and, uh, and, and they tell you more about the world. 
in Elite, the books actually came part of the game, and it also came with a novel called The Dark Wheel, which was sort of a, a story that you, was, was sort of played out in that universe. And in that sense, it's very much like a role-playing game. You write your own story as you play it. Um, so I hope I've given you some tools to write some new stories, do some new things with the game. Thanks very much.